Greetings, Mickey 102 I'm here to talk to you today about some enhancements in Microsoft Excel that you can use with the Visual Basic Editor and Visual, Basics, Visual Basic for Applications, or VBA. This is with regards to uh, the Simple Harmonic Motion Investigation. You can see I've already created a couple graphs in this spreadsheet. We have force versus time data for the oscillation of this spring mass system. The data were collected at 1,000 samples per second for 10 seconds. So the chart that you see on the right of spring force versus time actually has 10,000 data points there, 10,001 data points. Uh, so quite dense. You may recall that the point of the analysis in this case is to actually determine the period of oscillation. And it was recommended that that be done by looking at uh, value crossings. So for instance, perhaps I wanted to check where the uh, force curve here crosses the value of 2.5 newtons in consecutive periods. So maybe the, the first value here just before one second, and I might cut on where one, two, three, four, let's say five periods to just pass five seconds. <clears throat> if I could determine the time difference between those two crossings, then divide by that number of periods, I would get a measure for the actual period of the oscillation. So what I'm showing you here then on the left is another chart, which is the same chart. I created the first one on the right, duplicated it, placed it on the left here, and then I was going in and actually scaling the axes so that I could zoom in closer to see, first of all, the density of points here. The chart on the right does not have the, the data points connected by line. It's just that there are so many data points um, that it looks like they're connected. But if you zoom in, you can see it's actually just the dots, but there are a lot of them. So coming in near 2.5 uh, newtons here, I can see when I'm zoomed in that this is around, if I float my cursor over that, 5.255 seconds. <clears throat> so that would be one way to determine that consecutively, to go through here and zoom in to find these value crossings. Now, the, the sort of the crude way to do this, if you will, is if you double click on the uh, say the time axis or the x-axis, you could go in and change your bounds to be um, whatever you wanted and hit enter and it would update on the chart. Um, that's a little tedious, it's not bad, especially since you then have to go and double click on the y-axis in order to change that. So if I want this to come from, uh, let's say 2.3 or something, I could do that. What I'd like to do instead is, let me close that little pop-up. Uh, I have set up here on the spreadsheet some hard-coded cells <clears throat> where I have the x-axis scaling and the y-axis scaling. What I'd like to be able to do is enter the values in those cells and then have the, the chart automatically update accordingly. So I could set the numbers I want for the min and max in both the x and y axes. I've labeled them x axis and y axis here, maybe just for a little bit more ease. The x axis is time, the y axis is force, of course. Um, but there's a way that that, that can be done um, by extending the capabilities of Excel with the Visual Basic Editor and using Visual Basic for applications. So that's a key reason why I'm showing you this today. Not that this is a necessity, but it's just a flavor of what can be done to extend the operating capabilities here in Excel. First things I should point out, <clears throat> I'm going to be making use of the uh, information under this developer tab. So if you go up to the ribbon, you can see there's one that says developer. If I click on that, it has quite a few things in here. Actually, I was on design mode, it looks like. Visual Basic, macros, tools for recording macros and things related to that, and add-ins. Um, you may have used macros before. Macros is just a, a sort of a, a, a layman's term for doing programming in Visual Basic from a, from a, a fairly intuitive and, and um, less specific manner in the sense that you record the macro, you do things that you want to do on the spreadsheet, and then you can save that and fix that to a shortcut uh, keystroke or something like that that you can then repeat again and again. But what that's doing is recording Visual Basic for Applications VBA code in the background. We're going to go and explicitly do that sort of thing. <clears throat> in any event, if you do not have this developer tab showing, and you probably don't, you can go to File, <clears throat> way down at the bottom left to Options. When that comes up, you're going to click on Customize Ribbon because it is a toolbar that's in the ribbon. Um, and over on the right, you're gonna see here the main tabs. All you need to do is put a check in where it says developer. So mine is checked right now, yours, yours may have uh, no check in it if you're not seeing the developer tab. So you wanna make sure you put a check in there and hit okay, and if it was not previously showing the developer tab, it will now, <clears throat> okay? So when you're there, there's a number of ways you can get to where I'm about to go. You can click on this visual basic 
uh, button here opens the Visual Basic Editor. Uh, you can go down to the bottom where I have labeled this uh, sheet um, with, the, with this particular information for this data set. <clears throat> you may or may not have that. Obviously, yours may say sheet one or something like that. Regardless of what it says, if you right click on the name, you could select out in the middle here, view code, or there's a shortcut key, Alt F11 will also take you to Visual Basic Editor. Let me go ahead. I'm just going to click on the, the Visual Basic button at the top in the toolbar to begin with here. <clears throat> and it will open another window. And let me set this to how you would probably see it. And I should say that you probably would not see, well, if, if, if you're doing this uh, from a fresh workbook, you won't see any code here. So let me actually close that one. <clears throat> you may see it like this. You may see a blank white space. I'm not really sure what you'll see, but for all intents and purposes, you, you'll look sort of like it's blank. Now, I don't intend for this to be an in-depth uh, sort of study of what this is about. This is the Visual Basic Editor. It's a place where you can write code that's specific to um, Excel. <clears throat> Actually, I believe a lot of uh, Microsoft's products, Word, PowerPoint, all of them have the Visual Basic Editor. Um, things to note, there's a number of uh, other things over here that show up sort of the, the, the VBA projects. The one at the top is the analysis tool pack. So you can't actually get in there and do anything with that. It's looking for a password that's actually provided by Microsoft. Solver is another tool we'll probably look at uh, in the class. Um, Funcrest has to do, I'm not sure what that is. It, uh, I think it's another sort of an engineering pack of functions, but I'm not sure what that is. But anyway, you can see there is one here, a VBA project that is tied specifically to the workbook that I had opened that I was showing you before, the VBA for scaling chart axes, that label there, that's the workbook that I had open. If you had multiple workbooks open, you would see a VBA project for each one of those. You'll notice underneath that heading is a folder called Microsoft Excel Objects. And under that, there is a sheet one, and then a generic one for this workbook. So this is an object-oriented programming environment here. The approach to it here, it makes a distinction between objects and classes and methods and properties and things like that. Again, not something I'm going to go into with any depth. I just want to point out that all of these different objects here that characterize the way it's sort of organized, it's a little important to understand that because there's a certain what's called a scope to this. So things that you might program into this workbook would be available across all the sheets. Things that you, would pro that you would program just for a given sheet would apply only to that sheet. So <clears throat> let me right click on where it says sheet one. And you can see it is known as sheet one, even though I labeled it the 210.3 uh, grams trial one. Uh, it's, it, it's fundamentally sheet one here. If you right click on that and say view code, you might have seen this pop up originally when I was in here. I'm going to click and actually um, reduce the size of that up towards, or it says restore window here, but towards the top right. That really is a separate little code window inside this uh, interface, and it does have some code in already. Now, if you come into this Visual Basic Editor and you've just created your own workbook with a, with a sheet in it and you, and you do what I just did to show the code, this will almost certainly be completely blank because you haven't done anything yet. I want to show you if you right click on this workbook and say view code, that's probably what you would see when you first come into the um, blank sheet, something that doesn't have any code on it yet. So it's blank waiting for you to program something in there. And all I can say here in the general scheme of things, whatever code I might put into this workbook's code window, the scope of that, the terminology is scope, the scope would be across all of the stuff in the workbook. I'm going to close this because I'm not going to do that right now. Whatever I put in this, uh, and I have some in here for this code for sheet one, is has a scope only to this sheet, so it's only available to this sheet. Let me zoom in that a little bit. It's already been programmed. Um, you would have to type this in again if you want it in there. I provided in the pre-studio documentation for Hooke's Law and Simple Harmonic Motion just a screenshot of this because I, I intentionally wanted you to type this in. And I'll show you, it's not as bad as it looks. And, and I'm going to come down here and make some space. I'm going to repeat that. Well, first of all, there's the first line that says sub. That's short for subroutine. It is blue. That's a special, it's a recognized uh, word here in the editor. Scale axes. Okay, so I just called that. I made up that name, scale axes. Uh, it has no arguments that it takes as input. This doesn't return any arguments. It just does something. That's the basic concept of these subroutines. You can also make functions 
in VBA, and then they would be used in the cells by typing equals, and or however you would put it and bury it within some other formula. You can make your own functions. Functions typically do have some kind of input, but they may not, but they always have some kind of an output that will go back to the location in the cell. We may talk about those later as well. But for right now, these subs just do something. <clears throat> and let me tell you what this is doing. So if you type something like application dot, what we're doing is digging into what's called the component object model here. We're pulling off uh, features, getting burrowing down, so to speak, into all these classes of things. So the application refers to the application this is running in right now, the master set of everything that's available, which is Excel. And it actually has some nice prompts here as you start typing these little pop-up windows. So I could come down and select Active Sheet, hit Tab, Dot. So what I just did is I said go to the object that is the overall application. Within that, the dot says, and I'll pull out of that the active sheet, which is the one that this is residing in. So the active sheet in this case is the sheet one. VBA uh, it is, I forget now what I call it, 210.3 grams, I think, whatever the title was, but it is recognized as sheet one. The point is the active sheet is the one that this is resident in right now. Okay, and then what do we want out of that? I'll type chart objects. Not sure why, let me, let me do that, I might have missed that. Let me, if I do active sheet dot, I was expecting to pop that up, but it didn't. Chart objects. Now I've not been careful with the, the uh, uppercase here. It will correct that it is, as it recognizes that. So now it's saying select uh, out of the class here of the chart objects. In this case, I'm going to give this an argument. It's going to be specifically the chart that I'm interested in working on, and that is chart one. And I'll show you in a minute where that comes from. And it's in quotes because that is a very, it's an explicit name. And then finally, dot activate. Type that right. If I hit enter, I'm hoping it fixes all the, so you might have seen when I hit enter, it corrected all the uppercases and so forth. So that's a redundant line. I'm going to move that in a minute. I was hoping it would pop up after every dot. It may do that on yours. I'm not sure why it didn't on mine. Um, but at least to a certain sort of level of digging in this, it will pop up and show you the things that can be selected here. But what this does is it says, in the current application, in the current active sheet, you might wonder why do I have to specify that when we're there, but it's just kind of uh, the, the practice here. It's just the, the, the way it's done. The current application, the current active sheet of this class of, of chart objects, all the things that are in that, I want specifically chart one. Now, I actually have two charts in this sheet, right? I had the original one that was the full 10 seconds and the one that I want to work on where I'm actually zooming in. <clears throat> so I have to know which is which. But then the dot activate says, make that the current active chart. Okay, so let me remove all that. Oops. So I'm gonna get that, but I'm just trying to show you how I would have built that up here. So let me go back for just a moment. I'm gonna hit Alt F11 to switch back to it. <clears throat> Again, I have the two charts in here. If you click on the one that's on the left, the oscillating spring mass system, and you go over to the name box, you can see it's name chart one. You can change that. Uh, we've done that name box, we've used that before to name particular cells, um, like delta T or something, maybe gravity, something that was a specifically important value, and then that would appear in the formulas. But those names can be used for a lot more than that. It doesn't have to be just a cell, it can be a whole collection of cells. Or in this particular case, it's a the chart itself. So I am specifically saying that what I'm about to do with this subroutine scale axes will apply to chart one. So I'm going to go Alt F11, or here let me show you the other method. If I right click on the tab and say view code, it will take me back here. Let me zoom in again. <clears throat> now, with that chart, there are things I, I want to do very specific to it. And of course, that's the scale the axes. This next structure that says, you notice there's a, the word with and then end with, that's just a way to kind of condense some of the typing. It's, it says that whatever I put after the word with here, all of this stuff, I'll come down inside this structure and then what I'll do is line by line take all this other stuff and kind of append it to the end of it and make that one long line. So basically I don't have to repeat the application.activechart.axes uh, and then all this other stuff. I write that once and then all these other lines underneath. There's only two, but it still is a little bit more compact. Uh, we'll then attach to that. So again, this says what I'm doing here in each one of these cases. 
going to the application, going to the active chart, which I already then uh, have, have selected based upon that, that second line. Then I'm going specifically to the axes on that chart and of all of the axes that are there, because there are actually there's several axes that are available. Obviously, there's the X axis and the Y axis, but they have uh, at least the Y axis can have a secondary axis as well. OK, and there's also you could think about this, especially on the scatter chart. There are multiple plots that you can use um, on the Y axis. But in event, the first thing I'm going to do is come to axes. Excel category says that's selecting the X axis and Excel primary means the primary one. I'm not sure if you can do more than one axis on the X, uh, but even if you can, just the way this has been built, you still have to specify it's the primary one. An Excel category, it's not super intuitive here, but it means it's the category means what would typically be on the X axis. So some of this is not clear. It would only come from some experience, but that's what this is doing, selecting the X axis. So then when, it, when we get into the next line, the dot minimum scale says, again, take everything that was up there before, the application, the active chart, all the way through axes, and then dot minimum scale. So it's appending that to the end. So what that says is on that X axis, the minimum scale we are going to set to be equal to, to set to the value, which is, and here's the right side of this, on the active sheet, specifically the range labeled time min, and out of that, pick the value. So I'll have to show you, I don't know, I can't remember if I did or not, but we have a cell named time min, which is for the X axis, what I want to be the minimum axis value. And then the next line does the maximum scale, as you can see, active sheet range. I'm gonna get out of the active sheet, the cell that's labeled time max, the value for that, and make that the maximum scale for the X axis. That ends this with, and then I do the same thing here for the Y axis. That's referred to as XL value. Again, that's just how it is. It's not called Y, it's just called XL value. And if you think about it, the reason it's like that is because um, I know that uh, this is eventually attaching to a scatter chart, but there's a host of different uh, graphs and charts and things available in Excel for which they're not known as X and Y axes. They could be category and, and uh, bar graphs or something like that, in which case they're not really thought of as Y axes per se. And then again, that's just the syntax here. So Excel value, the primary one, minimum scale is equal to the value that comes out of a, a cell I've named force min, and then the maximum from a cell I've named force max. So let me zoom out. <clears throat> I'll go back to Alt F11 to the spreadsheet. Again, I have here, if I click on under X axis scaling, X min, Go over to the name box. I've called that time underscore min. There's a time underscore max, force underscore min, and a force underscore max. So again, I have those cells named. Now you do not have to name the cells. You can actually refer to them by their, their typical referencing E5, um, E6, and so forth. There's other ways to do that. I typically prefer to do this so that I can more easily move things on here if I wanted to, if I wanted to say uh, make these names point to a different cell for some reason or, or rearrange some things a little easier to do that but it's totally up to you but it is very important here once more back to the vba editor or the, uh, the visual basic editor I zoom in one again um, it is important though to note this is not a completely robust code in the sense that it only applies right now to what I called chart one. If I wanted it to apply to a different chart, I would have to come in here and change that. If I wanted to change what I was, where I was getting these values for the scales, I'd have to come in here and manually change things. Um, that's okay. I'm not trying to make something here that I'm going to be, you know, selling or, or trying to, to market somehow. This is, I'm just using this for this particular application. Uh, if for some reason I need to make these changes, it would be incumbent on me to come back in here and do that. And that's okay. This is just meant to be a relatively quick introduction and simple sort of uh, understanding of what you can do with the Visual Basic tools that are built into this. So let's see how this works. So I'll, first I'll show you this sort of clumsy way. Uh, if you come back here to the spreadsheet, and I, let's say I make a change, and I'll make the lower x-axis 5 hit enter, nothing has happened. Nothing does happen here until I run that sub. Now Excel is set up um, m most of the like Word and PowerPoint. Um, whenever you do any programming there, and really just the fundamental way it's programmed, these are, these are all programmed in the first place, they're event driven. 
programs, meaning they're waiting for events to occur to trigger something. So and it makes sense because it's waiting for you to do something. So when you click on buttons or I hit enter here, I change a formula, it wants to update and, and do something based on that. It's not just constantly running in the background and doing stuff uh, all the time per se. Most of it is just waiting for these so-called events to happen. So I need some kind of event for that. I can, if I go back to the editor and I go up to the toolbar, it's very tiny, but you can see this little green arrow. If I run that, I'll run the sub, go back to Excel. I don't know if you see that, but it did change it to five. Maybe I could make this, a, um, let's make this a bit more noticeable. Let's go from two to six or something. And I'll hit enter. If I go back over Alt F11, run this sub back to the spreadsheet. There you can see it did that only did the x-axis at that point because those are the only values that I changed on these cells. So it's working, but it's not convenient. So here's the way I'm going to fix that. I want to make some way on the, on the spreadsheet here that I can force it to run that sub when I want to without going over to the code. And that's where we're going to come up here to the developer tab. So if you're not over there, click on the developer tab and I'll just explain the process here. We're going to turn on design mode. So click on that and then you'll see it stays kind of a gray background here. That means what it's doing now is instead of running any kind of code and things like that that we're about to put in here, it's letting you place them and kind of design them. Then I'm going to say insert, and there are all these form controls and ActiveX controls. I want the form controls. The, the concept here is a form is a container that would contain all these different objects that are, that are interactive. Um, and right now the container is this whole spreadsheet, but I can put buttons and sliders and things on there. So I'm actually going to go to the top left and click on this command button, form controls. I'm going to click on that. If you come down in the spreadsheet, you can drag out what I want my button to look like. I'm going to make it not giant. The macro name. So now the button has to do something. That's what I was talking about before in terms of events. When you click the button, you have to assign it something it's going to do. And the key here is you would assign it a subroutine. So notice I already have one here, sheet one dot scale axes. That's the one that I have programmed. That's the name I gave. So I'm going to click on that and I'm going to say, okay. So now I'm still in design mode. Let's see. I think if I right click on that and say format control, you can do things such as the font, the alignment, size, the properties, so forth. I'm not going to change any of them. Um, let me go up here, properties from this. No, there's nothing there that I want to change. There's, I guess I can just change this by double clicking in here. I, I, I didn't know if there's a better way to show you that, but I'm, if you, if, when you're in design mode, now it, it doesn't show this background anymore, but the fact that these are all grayed out and uninsert is because I'm now working on this. So I, I am in the design mode because when I double clicked, it went in to edit this uh, this label instead of actually acting as a button. So I'm going to just call this scale axes. I'll click off of that. And now I'll unclick or I'll click on again the design mode button, but I'm unchecking it. So now it no longer has the dark gray background. It's no longer in design mode. It is now in its active mode. So if I click on the button, you can see it it has this sort of animation like a button. So let's make some changes here. Let's make this uh, like one to two seconds perhaps and I'll hit scale axes and now it's working the way it should. Okay. Maybe I would need to zoom out. Let's actually pick some better values in here. So let's say one, two, three, like the fourth peak here, the, the fourth full sort of uh, fifth overall. I think that's uh, somewhere like 3.2 to 3.6 maybe seconds. So let me put here my min 3.2, um, 3.6. I'll hit scale axes. And now I'm in there pretty good. I can see it's got that crossing at 2.5. I could change things, make it a little bit more specific. 3.4 scale axes. And I'm, I'm, I'm there. Maybe I want to reduce this a bit, reduce this on the vertical a bit more. 2.7, let's say. And you can really zoom in around where 2.5 is. So here there actually happens to be a little of a gap. So I'd have to make a decision either that 3.495 or 
3.497. So apparently I must have uh, missed one of the times in there. I would have expected one every one thousandth of them, every millisecond. Um, but in any event, you can see the idea here of how now the button is making the um, sub run. So that's the key thing I wanted to show you here. Again, you can zoom in to do this. It's, it's still a little tedious. You have to be careful where you're gonna zoom in and, and how many periods you count across and so forth. But now I no longer need to go in and, and double click on the axes um, in order to select a particular region. I can put whatever I want over here on the side, hit the button, and it will update both axes. And again, I Alt F11 to show you the code that does that. It's relatively simple. Uh, if, if you wanted to change this to other things, to a different chart, you would have to mi make modifications in here if it was on this sheet. That's one last thing here I want to point out that's key. This right now is tied only to sheet one. All of this is within that scope. Come back Alt F11. That is chart one that's on this sheet, as you can see it labeled. And I have named ranges, named cells for time min, time max, and so forth. But <clears throat> if I come down, I'll right click and I'll say move or copy this sheet. Let's create a copy. I'll move it to the end. I'll hit OK. So I'm not going to worry about, well, maybe I will change this name here just to, just to distinguish here. It's going to be exactly the same data, but I might change a name just to kind of emphasize that that might be something you do if you wanted more than one um, sheet here to have the analyses in. What I want to point out is now this is a this is a copy, but a brand new sheet. Otherwise, it still has the same names. So time min, time max, force min, force max. Those are the scope of those names are within each sheet. So those are distinct cells between and names between the sheets, uh, the worksheets here. And this grab this chart is still called chart one on this worksheet. If we go back to F11, the Visual Basic Editor, now you can see there's sheet two. If I right click and say view code, you can see it has its own code, which is direct copy of the code that's in sheet one. It will function perfectly well in the new sheet, just like it did on the other one. So I can come in and put some value here, five, let's say, and scale that. And I can go from three to 10 whatever you want to do. I'm just trying to emphasize, so that's not a very good choice of axes, but nonetheless, uh, it did this independently of what was on sheet one. So I copied that, made a brand new copy, but it still functions exactly the same way. They're not tied together between those two worksheets. You have to be very careful though, if you put something in the uh, code for this workbook, that would have a wider scope. And so you sometimes have to be quite careful about how you do those things. Now that's a, a wider topic that I want to get into. I just wanted to show you the basic idea here. I should point out, if I close this Visual Basic Editor, I don't lose my code. That is now closed, but you can always go back. And if I save it, it's still there. It's saved with this workbook. It is not a separate file. It's saved right in here. But there is a difference now you might notice up at the top here of the window. This is now a dot XLSM, and the M standing for a macro enabled workbook. Um, the, the standard Excel file is an XLSX. So that is important. It should prompt you if you if you don't uh, if you don't know what I'm about to say, it should prompt you when you go to save this that it can't save the programming and those macro features in a regular Excel workbook. You have to save it as a macro enabled workbook. If you don't do that, it'll just strip everything off and all your code will be gone. Um, so do save it as a, as a macro enabled workbook. That means also when you open it back up, it will likely have a little pop up. This is something to the effect of, do you want to enable content? It may prompt you to save it as a trusted source. You can do that if you like, uh, but just be aware it is a slightly different I guess it's really a, a quite a bit different uh, version of a file, but otherwise, it, you know, the, the forward facing part of this uh, is still Excel, although you might dress this up with some other features. So some really neat things that you can do. I just pick, pick this particular one to show you about uh, a, a way to use a button on here to run a sub to change the axes of a chart. Thanks for watching.